Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CHK Law. Welcome to our to the first of our Greater China Legal Seminar series of this academic year. My name is Lutz Christian Wolf. I'm one of the co-organizers of the uh, Greater China Legal Hello. History Seminar series. Of course, together with today's speaker, Professor Steve Gallagher. We are very proud that uh, our series now runs for the eighth in the eighth year. Um, and that the interest in the seminars is actually growing and growing. Today we had, uh, but today's seminar we had about 620 or even more registrations, uh, which of course also reflects the fact that today's speaker is one of the stars in the field. Um, he has been um, a moderator and a speaker of past seminars and is well known to many of today's participants. Professor Steve Gallagher, the speaker, is a professor of practice in law here at CHK Law, uh, and he's also our associate dean for academic and student affairs. Steve is an internationally known expert in legal history and cultural heritage, and in high demand, uh, all those conferences, they all want him to speak there. What many people don't know that he is a former art dealer and has special expertise uh, in relation to legal aspects relating to legal and uh, illegal trading of art pieces, including NFTs. Um, although Steve always tells us that NFTs as such are not art, uh, or at least not uh, in the sense that we would assume. Uh, Professor Gallagher, the speaker has written and spoken widely about topics relating to legal history and cultural heritage. Today's talk is of course based on his famous book, um, which was published last year uh, by Springer, uh, which I can highly recommend to you. It's a great read, um, very informative and um, also entertaining, if I may say. Um, it's, it's great for everybody who's interested in old buildings here in Hong Kong. Now, before I pass the floor to uh, Professor Gallagher, let me say that as in our other uh, Greater China Legal History Seminar series, if you have any questions, please use the chat function, set them in. Uh, we have at the end about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A um, and I will present all the questions um, on your behalf to Professor Gallagher. Um, that's from me. Thank you all for joining uh, today's seminar. And with this, over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Lutz. And, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. If I just load my PowerPoint, Hopefully you can see my PowerPoint now. Um, and yes, it, it's great to be here at the beginning of the eighth year of the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series and to see so many familiar faces and familiar names as well, and also lots of new names as well. So thank you for joining us today. So as Lutz said, it, it's my pleasure to talk today about protecting built heritage in Hong Kong. Uh, when we think of Hong Kong, of course, we may not think there is much in the way of built heritage when we think of such a, a wonderful modern and vibrant city. Um, of course, I'm using that term built heritage. So let me just start by saying, why am I using that term? There are a number of terms that are used to represent what I'm going to be referring to as built heritage today. Traditionally, the term immovable has been used for buildings and, and other structures uh, and, and humankind's interference with, uh, with, the, with the earth and leaving uh, tracks on the earth. Uh, but if we think about this today, the, the term immovable has long not been really uh, applicable to all of these buildings that we're talking about. Here, of course, is, is Murray House, um, uh, a, a building uh, which, of course, was originally in Central, uh, just by the site of the now the Bank of China building in Central. And of course, uh, this was moved, uh, it was dismantled piece by piece. Originally, this is one of the, the contentious sort of issues in Hong Kong's history to do with its built heritage. Uh, Murray House, there was an uproar when people knew that Murray House was going to be just demolished uh, and the colonial government had to give in uh, and promise to rebuild Murray House elsewhere. So they, they took it apart in 1982 uh, and of course it went into storage and stayed there for a number of years, about 20 years, um, being uh, re rebuilt in Stanley. Uh, where it stands today, opened in 2002. So immovable is a difficult term. In fact, if we look at Murray House today, if we look to the left of it, we of course have Blake Pier as well, which is another structure which came from Central and was rebuilt in uh, Stanley in 2006. So um, 
immovable doesn't really work too much today. I'm going to use the term built heritage, which for me, um, I've tried to come up with a, a sort of a meaning which en encapsulates everything I'll be using. So it's evidence of the activities and achievements of humankind affecting the natural landscape and the subsequent changes to these that should be passed on for the benefit of future generations. That tries to uh, encompass the whole idea of heritage, of passing something on. Um, but just because we want to pass something on or perhaps preserve or conserve it doesn't always mean that it's a it's a positive reminder of what of what humans have done. So we should remember that some of this this heritage is contentious. It may be dark. It may be quite negative in character. And um, possibly one of the best examples of this is uh, the kindergarten near to where I live in Saikung, uh, which many of you may pass and, and some of you will know. Um, has a has a bit of a, a dark past because, of course, this building was was built as a private house uh, in the late 1930s in Saikung. It would have been on the waterfront at the time in Saikung. Uh, but then during the Second World War, it was used as a base by the Japanese and, and various uh, terrible things occurred in that building. So it's a building where not many people acknowledge uh, um, its history, but it does have a, a part to play in the heritage of Hong Kong. So built heritage can also remind us of of the bad things that have happened in the past as well. And there's still, I think, value in preserving and remembering that heritage. So let's think again about built heritage in Hong Kong. Again, as I said, many people would question um, the idea of built heritage in Hong Kong. If we think of China as a whole, of course, we've got some magnificent examples of, of built heritage. Um, many, of course, on UNESCO's World Heritage List from the Great Wall uh, to the city walls of Xi'an as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, examples of incredible achievements of humankind in the past, which we could all value and we can see have a value to all of us. So then when we think of Hong Kong, and I'm afraid this was a, a photograph taken on quite a dark day looking across Hong Kong, um, we might again question that idea of what sort of built heritage have we got? So if we think about this, we should first of all remember that Hong Kong has got a long history. Uh, we tend to think of Hong Kong as being just the, the British colony and the, the post-colonial period. But, of course, our archaeologists in Hong Kong have now established that Hong Kong has been inhabited at least since the Neolithic period. So we've got about a 6,000-year history as well. The, 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 the point that will be raised is often there's not many buildings, not many sites preserved which evidence this rich past. And, of course, many people would say, well, there's no built heritage before the British got here and it became a colony. Um, also, again, if people are thinking of uh, built heritage in Hong Kong, they often think of the buildings in the new territories. Um, so we should just remind ourselves very quickly of Hong Kong and its its history. As I said, that 6,000 year history, um, uh, archaeological evidence of um, uh, settlement uh, by uh, China's civilization going back many, many thousands of years. Um, we then get, of course, the, the British uh, taking Hong Kong as a colony initially in 1841, depending on how you date these things, uh, with Hong Kong Island, and then, of course, the Kowloon Peninsula in 1860, and the New Territories and the outlying islands in 1898. So we get this sort of idea of everything really comes from that, that British period. But there were things that predate the British being here, and there are some very important examples of built heritage. If we go to Hong Kong Island itself, of course, there are the temples, are, um, as in the Hong Qing Temple here at Apli Chow, dating from 1773. In Kowloon, we have the Hao Wong Temple uh, in Kowloon City, of course, dating from 1730. And of course, in Kowloon as well, we have Hong Kong's oldest, if you like, uh, heritage building, the Li Chung Ik Han Tomb. Uh, which dates from, well, almost 2,000 years old, coming up now, 1,800 to 2,000 years old, depending on how you actually date this as well. And a very important building in the development of Hong Kong's legal protection for its cultural heritage. If we do go into the new territories, though, we've got a rich built heritage there from the, the walled villages, uh, uh, the temples, uh, the, the scholar uh, houses and everything else, which are wonderful and it's great to wander around there. My favorite uh, trail, heritage trail, is the Ping Shan Trail. I think the Dean would agree it's a great trail to, to go along. And of course, we've got uh, Hong Kong's uh, only old pagoda there as well, which dates from 1390. It may be a, a few levels down from what it originally was, but again, a very important piece of Hong Kong's built heritage as well. We should also remember as well that we are developing some post-colonial 
built heritage. So we should remember things like the, the Chilean nunnery, although that was uh, the beginnings of this, of course, back in the late 1940s during the colonial period, we usually date built heritage by its its end date when it was uh, when it was uh, finished. And of course, that would be about 1999. So we can start talking about post-colonial built heritage as well. There are many issues for built heritage in Hong Kong. Um, they have the Hong Kong's buildings face the usual uh, problems that all buildings do. Um, as soon as a, a building is is built, of course, we need to start to maintain it. So maintenance of buildings is always a problem. Um, uh, corrosion down to pollution and other issues uh, always affect all buildings. So we have the usual problems for modern uh, city. But of course, our most important problem for our built heritage is the lack of building land. We are um, 426 uh, square miles of land, of which only 25% has been developed. And of course, in Hong Kong, that's included incredible feats of reclamation from the sea, of building on slopes that perhaps elsewhere in the world no one would ever build on um, because of our unusual terrain. So we have got a, a lack of a commercially viable building land, and that's a big problem. We also saw at times rapid rises in population, uh, various issues. In 1949, in the 1950s, of course, coming through into the 1960s, rapid rise in population, which meant there was a huge pressure on older buildings to redevelop. Um, there's always been this pressure to develop. There are other issues that, of course, uh, raise that issue uh, or, or increase the idea that we will have redevelopment of old buildings, demolished, demolition, and building of new buildings. Uh, for example, in Hong Kong, of course, we have the concept of leasehold for our buildings with only one site in Hong Kong not being subject to that. So leasehold in its way also encourages the idea that these buildings are temporary and should be replaced. And one of the other issues that's faced our buildings in Hong Kong is the fact that we've been a very wealthy city. And of course, with wealth, uh, of course, you get the, uh, the impetus to perhaps show off that wealth and replace old buildings with new buildings that show uh, uh, that success, that power, that wealth as well. So if we think of the HSBC building, which is not everyone's favorite building, it's a, it's a bit of one of those buildings where either you love it or you hate it, um, that is the, the fourth building to be on that site since 1856. So we are talking about a, um, a, you know, a, a huge pressure on redevelopment probably more than, than any other uh, comparable city. Um, this results in, again, even for what many would consider to be quite insignificant buildings, um, the idea that they will disappear. So this is uh, a photograph of a small ancestral hall uh, near to the village I live in, which I used to pass regularly as I walked into Sai Kung. And uh, I like this building. I don't know why it may be run down or whatever else, but it, it had character, I always thought. And, of course, uh, with the mid-autumn recently, I would have gone past that in the evenings. There would have been uh, the incense burning, the lights going as well. It was a very atmospheric little building, I always thought. So when I passed it one day and there was this, I was quite disappointed. Uh, and I was a little bit worried about what would replace it as well, because living in a, in a, in a village in the New Territories, I just expected, of course, a couple of small houses to replace it and have some accommodation for, uh, for guaylos like me uh, as well. So. I was a little bit worried about this. It, again, I think evidence is the pressures on um, old buildings in Hong Kong. The other thing is this, Hong Kong has often been identified as a temporary place. And I think all of those factors I mentioned before bring this in. Um, when it was a British colony, there was the, always the idea that because of the new territories, it would be subject to the terms of the, the lease. And I put that in inverted commas because one of our future speakers, Malcolm Merry, of course, as pointed out many times that this was not a lease, um, but the idea that the uh, the British would return the new territories after 99 years always meant that there was this idea that it would be a temporary place. And for many people, not just the British, other Europeans and the Chinese who often came here, the idea was that it would be a place to make money and then move on. Um, and uh, again, many Chinese used uh, um, Hong Kong as a stepping stone to work in other aspects, other parts of the British Empire, or to move on to the United States uh, during the 19th century because of the problems in Qing China as well. Um, other issues, the revolution of 1911, the warlords in the 1920s, the Japanese in the 1930s in China as well, World War II and the revolution of 1949 meant that we often got people coming into Hong Kong, seeing it as a 
as a place of refuge, but a stepping stone to move on to other places. And again, I think that's why it was considered to be a temporary place. In the mid 1980s, sorry, 1980s, uh, with the Sino-British Joint Declaration, again, um, there was an idea that people could see perhaps an end to the, the colony of Hong Kong. And so people, again, didn't have much connection or, or much impetus to actually preserve old buildings or old heritage. And again, many still see Hong Kong as a temporary place. They, they see the, the 2047 uh, idea of the end of the, um, uh, the one country, two systems, uh, perhaps changing the way that people will live in Hong Kong. Also, we've had the issues with the social unrest, the national security law and the COVID measures as well has meant that many people have, have questioned uh, how long they would stay in Hong Kong. And we see this in our, in our newspapers every day. So again, people don't have so much of a connection at times to the heritage of Hong Kong. Anyway, that's, that's what many people have said. And that's what many people have put forward as a reason for in the past, they're not being too much protection of our heritage. We did get some um, uh, protection in Hong Kong with the um, instigation of laws. It comes about in this way. I wanted to break it down into these uh, uh, seven main parts and perhaps some conclusions as long as we have time. The first is um, I'm going to talk about the development of protection for built heritage in Hong Kong before 1976, because 1976 is the, is the big year. That is when the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance was brought into effect. Um, so then we'll move on and talk about the, the ordinance, talk about some of the problems with the ordinance before 1997, so under the colonial uh, um, administration. And then we'll talk about 1997, the Hong Kong SAR, and um, issues to do with built heritage in that period, 1997 to 2006. And then we'll talk about those two very important years, 2006, 2007, where we saw social unrest linked into issues to do with our built heritage and people being very concerned about our built heritage. Um, then we'll talk about the, um, the concessions, really, that the, the government gave in 2007 and afterwards because they realised how much heritage, I think, meant uh, to the people of Hong Kong, something that they had uh, miscalculated. Um, we'll talk about some of the successes and failures after 2007. And if I can, I'd like to talk about if I can focus on the successes, really, more than anything else and draw some conclusions at the end. So let's start thinking about the development of protection for built heritage in Hong Kong up to 1976. The first public protection in Hong Kong, well, it follows the usual way, I think, that built heritage has been protected around the world. Generally, built heritage, if there aren't specific laws to actually protect uh, buildings or, or protect heritage in general, well, then buildings that have been protected usually evidence uh, wealth, power and religion or religion, or actually often all three. So if you think about St. John's Cathedral, the fact that actually when it was set up, it was uh, the, the land was meant to be designated in perpetuity for St. John's Cathedral, the site there, gives us an idea that there was um, an intention that this should be a permanent site, that the building should be protected. Our other buildings that we think of that, that have been retained from uh, that period, or at least a little bit later than that, we think of other buildings in Hong Kong, which again evidence that wealth, power, um, and of course we think of things like the old Supreme Court building. If we haven't got buildings that are protected because they represent that sort of wealth and power, uh, well then the other way that buildings have often been protected again around the world, and we see it in Hong Kong, is because they are inaccessible, um, so they don't get reused, or they're forgotten. And of course we had an example of this in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, uh, when, uh, of course, the, the reservoir of Bishop's Hill uh, was uh, the water authority started to demolish it. And of course, we then had people objecting to this. We'll come back to that at the end, because I think that's a story we can turn into a successful story as well. But our first law in Hong Kong is to do with the, the rock, uh, the site of Sung Wan Toy, uh, the famous rock with the inscription to the, um, to the emperor, uh, the two young boys who came uh, apparently and visited Hong Kong on their flight uh, from uh, persecution back in the 1270s as well. So this rock, very important, symbolic in uh, the Hong Kong area and to uh, southern China as well. Um, when the British um, took uh, Kowloon in 1860, 
Um, there had been mention of this in the negotiations that the rock should be in some way preserved. And um, this was raised later on uh, by a very famous character in Hong Kong, um, Okai, uh, who, of course, is one of the, the first Chinese members of the Legislative Council. Of course, it was one of the unofficial members of the Legislative Council. So we get him raising the issue of uh, Song Wan Toy uh, on the 15th of August, 1898, at a Legislative Council meeting, where he says um, he was proposing that it is desirable in the interests of the public that the piece of ground situate at British Kowloon and generally known as Song Wan Toy or Song Wan Tong, together with a certain area of land surrounding and adjacent thereto as delineated and marked red on the annex plan, should not be let for building or other purposes, but should be reserved for the benefit of the public in perpetuity, and that the same should be delimited and marked off and kept in good order by the public works department of this colony. Now, he does expand on his reasons for actually um, promoting uh, the the reservation of this particular area of land and the protection of the rock. He said, my principal motive is to preserve an additional open space for the colony of Hong Kong and its dependencies. And he does go into some detail. I'm afraid I had to cut some of the quote out. I know we should always keep the quotes together, but it was quite extensive there, where he explains that it should be a place where the people of Hong Kong can go and relax. And uh, it, it, he carries on. I wish to preserve for the colony of Hong Kong a monument of some antiquity. There stands on this spot a large stone with an inscription upon it close upon 600 or over 600 years old. Everywhere in this colony we meet with new objects, inventions of modern civilization, but in this one spot we can gaze upon a monument of over 600 years old. And although I'm not a very great admirer of antiquity, still at the same time I think we owe it to ourselves and to the public of Hong Kong to see that this particular spot is preserved. My third reason for wishing to preserve this piece of ground is to carry out the stipulation which the Chinese government made when Kowloon was leased and finally ceded to Great Britain. If you refer to old papers, you will find that the stipulation was contained in the treaty ceding Kowloon that this spot, Song Wong Toy, together with the hill on which it stands, should be reserved forever. This stipulation has not been carried out. We have not done anything with the site but I think the stipulation has been lost sight of more or less. Now, again, in his expansion, he does focus on it being a, a place of rec recreation, but he does acknowledge the antiquity of the rock and its importance because of this, even though he says it's not really, you know, he's not a great admirer of this. Uh, but then he focuses on this idea again, that this had been a promise that had been made to the British, uh, to the Chinese government. And of course, 1898, this is when the negotiations are going on to whatever extent they were ever held. Uh, with uh, the, the Qing government um, to, for the, the lease of the new territories. So I think it's no coincidence that this came about. A year later, again, uh, when the, the new territories have now been leased, we get the Song Wang Toy Reservation Ordinance, which is to protect this particular area. We'll come back to Song Wang Toy a little bit later on. It wasn't completely successful, by the way, in the 1920s. Um, another uh, issue was raised in the Legislative Council uh, because it seems some local developers were trying to develop the land or purchase the land and everyone seemed to have forgotten about the ordinance. Uh, of course, that's often what happens with heritage ordinances. They get passed and then people forget about them. But anyway, we'll move on. The next big issue to do with our heritage is to do with the Second World War, which, of course, is to do with, with the destruction, really, that went on during the Second World War. And, of course, that was the same around the world um, in in, in both uh, um, the West and in the East as well. There were some additions that came to our heritage because of the Second World War. Um, the, the, the governor's house, of course, ended up with a new cupola and a couple of other additions where there was a big debate at the end of the Second World War about what should happen to these and they were retained. There was, of course, a Japanese war memorial which was built and was, just, was, was, was blown up in 1947, although the base of it still exists in Hong Kong as well. And we actually did get some sort of traditional Chinese buildings which were built um, during the Second World War as well. But apart from that, it's probably a time that we need to move on for and think of some of the things that happened post-war because of what had happened in the Second World War. One of the issues that of course arose was to do with Song Wong Toy, uh, because of course the, the Japanese wanted to remove the Sacred Hill itself uh, because, of course, it, it interfered with them actually landing planes at Kai Tak. And in doing so, they blew up the rock. Um, uh, at the end of the Second World War, um, all that was left, well, luckily, the, the inscription was still there and a decision was made to actually cut the inscription out and recite it. So it was now recited in its own little garden. Of course, the, um, the legislation was actually repealed 
because of course in, in some ways well the land is no longer uh, a subject to any uh, uh, reservation and the rock itself is now in a separate area the next big uh, important thing that happened in hong kong's history to do with the protection of its built heritage was the discovery of the late ching uh, ching book two uh, in 1955 so in the building works that were going on to build one of Hong Kong's first public housing estates because of the, the issue of finding accommodation after the great fire in, in Chek Kip May, um, the, the construction workers discovered the tomb. And luckily, um, very quickly, this is mentioned, uh, not too much is doing in the way of damage and, and nothing seems to have been really removed from the tomb at the time. But um, the finding of the tomb raised the big issue because of course, uh, Hong Kong had no specific laws which would protect the two. And so I think the, the colonial authority have been quite happy to just carry on thinking we can develop anywhere. There's never any worries about us uh, you know, interfering with anything of value. And suddenly this tomb is found. So, of course, for the, the colonial government, it, it's really a bit of a problem. Any government trying to quickly develop land, it's always a problem to have any restrictions on your free use of the land. Um, but it also, again, evidences more about Hong Kong's long history and sort of belies the idea that uh, Hong Kong is just important because of the colonial period as well. The Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance can be traced back to the discovery of the tomb. The tomb was discovered in 1955. It took a long time before we actually get the ordinance, but it is a direct response to this. And again, if you're interested in a, a detailed sort of consideration of the development of the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, then I'll refer you to William Meacham's book, uh, which details uh, uh, the discussions about this as well. In the, in the early 1960s, um, uh, drafts were being put forward, but it wasn't until 19, oops, 1971 uh, that LegCo actually uh, uh, passed this particular ordinance, and it wasn't until 1976 that it was actually commenced as well. Um, the Antiquities and Monuments section was also created in the Urban Services Department at the same time, and the Antiquities Advisory Board was formed as well, which met first in 1977. The Antiquities Advisory Board will come back to it a little bit later on, but of course their purpose being to, um, to bring experts together to discuss uh, what uh, heritage in Hong Kong should be protected, what should be uh, identified as a monument in Hong Kong. So it performs a very useful role. So the problems with the ordinance to begin with, its main purpose is not to protect built heritage. It was all really about archaeology. That was the emphasis to begin with. It was archaeologists who'd really uh, been uh, uh, campaigning for this. It was the discovery of the tomb, which really led to the ordinance being uh, developed. And that's why its purpose is really to do with the preservation, as it says there, of historical, archaeological and paleontological interest and for matters ancillary thereto or connected therewith. However, because of the way it's worded, it does give two forms of protection for built heritage. The first is an automatic form, and that is because there is a duty to report the discovery of antiquities and relics. So if our built heritage comes into the category of an antiquity, there is some automatic protection. The second is by declaration, and the Antiquities Authority, and at the moment that's the Secretary for Development, um, may uh, declare um, a, a site, a building, as a proposed monument or a monument, and that brings protection there. The um, automatic protection then is really given to antiquities. We'd be thinking of sites really here. And antiquity is defined in um, the, uh, the ordinance as a relic. Uh, and again, that is something of human manufacture made before the year 1800, 1799. But the antiquity itself would then be a place, building, site or structure erected, formed or built by human agency before the year 1800, and the ruins or remains of any such place, building, site or structure, whether or not the same has been modified, added to or restored after the year 1799. Now, many people have pointed out or, or asked the question, why 1800? Why 1799? And it seems it seems almost arbitrary that the, the date was chosen. There are uh, some records of discussions going on uh, at the time where it seems that, that many members of the administration uh, thought that was a safe date to come up with because there wasn't much in Hong Kong that would be before this. Um, Angus Forsyth, as of course, has written about this and said, you know, given that Hong Kong was ceded to the United Kingdom in 1841, uh, the ordinance provides no recognition of antiquity in the buildings of the colonial period after 1841. So there was even no intention in the, uh, the colonial administration to even protect the buildings that had been built when Hong Kong 
was a colony as well. But there just seems to have been the idea of, again, perhaps we're only thinking of very, very old things and we shouldn't worry too much. There isn't much in Hong Kong. The uh, monument, uh, uh, the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance uh, does give us definitions. I'll come on to those of what uh, a monument and a proposed monument is and explains when the authority can actually declare these monuments and any restrictions on that power as well. Um, also specifies the powers of the authority uh, of what they can do once there is the declaration of a proposed monument or monument and what sort of protection there is at that point. Once, um, once a building or a site is declared to be a proposed monument or a monument, then everything to do with that site becomes really subject to a licensing scheme. Even if we are talking about private land, um, a monument being declared of a, or a proposed monument being declared of private land, the private landowner is now restricted in their use of that land. And of course, that's why this is, this is quite an important power as well. Uh, again, there is a compensation scheme available for private owners as well because of this interference with their, um, their rights to do with their land as well. And the ordinance actually contains penalties to do with people who disregard these restrictions and protections of uh, the monuments and the proposed monuments as well. However, I would say that the, the penalties are not that high and when we consider similar schemes in other jurisdictions and the fact that often developers have chosen to deliberately perhaps uh, demolish um, a, a building that is subject to protection because when they weigh up what the cost is of actually paying any penalties, um, well, it often works out to be more commercially viable. As I said before, the Antiquities Authority at present is the Secretary for Development. So our definition of a declared monument is any place, building, site or structure which the authority considers to be of public interest by reason of its historical, archaeological or paleontological significance. And of course, really, historical is the important word there. That's what many of our uh, monuments in Hong Kong today, the ones that we think of are the interesting buildings we have, really come into that category. The ordinance um, uh, defines the monument there as um, any of these uh, places which have been declared by the authority under um, their power in section three of the ordinance. A proposed monument um, is an emergency measure which was added in 1982. The Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance has been amended twice. 1982 um, was probably the most significant change which was to do with this adding of the uh, ability to declare a proposed monument. So this just provides that the authority may declare any place building site or structure a proposed monument, proposed historical building or proposed archeological or paleontological site or structure. Um, the Antiquities Authority doesn't need the approval of the Chief Executive, but they must consult the Antiquities Advisory Board when they make this decision, although they don't have to follow the Antiquities Advisory Board. And that's uh, advice. And that's the same when it comes to a monument as well. And we'll see that with some of the controversial cases in Hong Kong. The authority may declare a proposed monument for a maximum of 12 months. Um, and again, I'll mention some of the cases to do with the proposed monuments very shortly. Um, uh, the authority um, may allow the de declaration to then lapse, withdraw it or declare the proposed monument a monument. Obviously, the idea originally was that you'd be declaring a proposed monument with the idea you would then negotiate with the private landowner to then perhaps agree some compensation for the proposed monument to become designated, gazetted as a monument and get um, the permanent protection. Uh, anyone who is a landowner where their building is uh, uh, identified as a proposed monument may object to the authority and to the chief executive, uh, and there are appeals procedures in there, and the objection procedure is in the ordinance as well. However, um, it has been decided uh, in 2007 in cases linked into the um, uh, the Queen's Ferry, uh, sorry, the Queen's Pier uh, um, dispute that the chief executive's direction is final and not open to review by the courts. Um, and again, there is a, a similar procedure for monuments as well. Um, so it was an emergency measure brought in. It's been used six times since it was introduced in 1982. These are the six times. The first um, was the Old oh, Lear Synagogue in 1987, which was a particularly uh, uh, brutal um, uh, issue in Hong Kong's built heritage history. We'll come to that very shortly. Um, the Morrison Building in 2003, uh, which was then declared a monument. The, the synagogue was not declared a monument. Uh, the Jessville Mansion, which was uh, not declared a monument and still not declared a monument. 
Kingyan Lee, which many people will know is a wonderful building, uh, which was uh, eventually purchased by uh, the Hong Kong government in a, in a land swap deal and declared a monument in 2008. Houghton Gardens, which again is one of those very famous controversial cases, because of course um, the uh, proposed monument status was withdrawn there and the building was demolished. And then the Hung Lao, the, the, the Red House in 2017, uh, where there was concerns that this particular building would be uh, demolished by its owner and new buildings built in its place. The government negotiated with the owner and has agreed to provide some financial support for preservation work. And the deal is that the, uh, the owner has said he won't develop the building for some 10 years. So the proposed monument status um, has worked in some ways. The old Leo Synagogue one, it didn't really, at least I suppose it drew attention, but we'll come back to that a little late, later on. But the Morrison building, yes, a declared monument. King Yin Lee, yes, we get the land swap and it declared a monument. Jessville Mansion, still not a declared monument, but it is still there. And uh, Hung Lao, of course, we get that negotiation, uh, which protects it as well. Possibly the worst case is, of course, the Houghton Gardens because it was demolished. The Antiquities and Monuments Office um, is the executive arm which actually enforces uh, everything to do with the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance um, and responsible for everything to do with the day-to-day -day protection and preservation of Hong Kong's built heritage. It also conducts these rescue excavations of archaeological sites as well and serves as the Secretariat of the Antiquities Advisory Board. The Antiquities Advisory Board, as I said, was formed uh, at the same time that the uh, ordinance came into effect in 1976, but first met in 1977. The members are unpaid citizens who are appointed by the chief executive. Their main purpose is to identify buildings which will in the future um, should be given protection as monuments as well. Um, the Antiquities Advisory Board has developed a grading scheme, uh, grade one, grade two and grade three, to identify these, these buildings which should be considered for protection, grade one being of course the highest. But of course, this is a purely administrative scheme. It, they have no powers whatsoever. It's purely to identify for the benefit of the Antiquities Authority as well. So if we think back to really pre the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance coming into, if we think of some of the issues that arose there, um, lots of buildings uh, went missing in Hong Kong that people lamented even at the time. One of the most famous was the General Post Office building. Uh, had been built in 1911 and demolished in 1976, just at the time that the ordinance was coming into effect. So a lot of people uh, lamented the, the passing of this building, um, although some people did actually at the time criticise the building. My favourite comment about this building comes from the author John Le Carre, who in his book, The Honourable Schoolboy, describes it thus. Joining the crowds again, he sauntered towards the post office, built 1911 and since pulled down, but in those days a rare and hideous antique made beautiful by the clumsy concrete of the buildings around it. So we have to remember that not everyone appreciates these older style buildings as well. 1976 to 1997, there were a number of issues that faced the colonial administration. And we have to be honest and say that the colonial administration did not, having, having gazetted, having brought into effect the ordinance, they didn't really work very hard to actually protect Hong Kong's built heritage. Of course, there would have been individuals within the administration who would have tried to do this, but there are lots of issues that arose. One of the most famous, of course, was to do with the Kowloon Canton Railway uh, um, terminal down at TST. Um, and of course, opposite to it was the, the old Marine Police headquarters as well. Um, the administration planned to demolish these and lots of people demonstrated. In fact, they actually sent letters to the, the late Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, to ask for her assistance as well. And as was traditional in those circumstances, she, of course, referred to her governor, uh, who, of course, had decided that actually he didn't like the buildings and that they were going to go. Um, of course, the, the railway terminals went in the face of much public opposition. And today, all we have left, of course, is the clock tower, uh, which we see from the Star Ferry here as well. Um, the other uh, I think most important case was, of course, the Earl Lear Synagogue. As I said, William Meacham details his struggle to do with the protection of this building uh, in his book. Um, again, Hong Kong's first use of the proposed monument status. So it did look like the government was steady, stepping in to actually protect the building. The trustees of the synagogue had decided that the building would go in a huge redevelopment. That it would cost them too much to restore the building and other th things. Uh, in the end, the government uh, 
uh, withdrew the proposed monument status. Um, guidance was sought from the Chief Rabbi of London about whether the building should be removed. It looked like the building was going to be redeveloped. And then issues arose within the particular community of this synagogue, which meant that the building in the end was preserved. But we should face the fact that the trustees of this building were, were quite clear that they wanted to get rid of the building, uh, which of course is quite ironic, considering that many years later, those trustees were awarded uh, um, a, uh, an award for the preservation of the building as it is now, because they were quite clear that they wanted to get rid of the building at the time. When we get to 1997, um, we have a sort of, uh, and initially, again, I think a concern about what's going to happen to built heritage in Hong Kong, um, particularly, of course, the built heritage linked into its colonial past. And if we think about many uh, former colonies around the world, um, the new regimes that come in often get rid of reminders of their colonial past. But things actually started quite well. Our first chief executive um, drew attention to the value of heritage in Hong Kong and, and made some promises in his, his uh, uh, in his addresses to us as well, which seemed to be quite good. The gazetting of monuments continued. In fact, it continued at a sort of an equal rate with the colonial regime uh, as well. And we get some important developments in um, identification of buildings. The Antiquities and Monuments Office finished a territory-wide survey of some 8,800 buildings in um, Hong Kong as a whole which had begun under the uh, colonial administration, but was now finished uh, uh, under the um, Hong Kong SAR. Um, as part of this, the Antiquities Advisory Board developed their administrative guidelines. I mentioned before that grade one, grade two, grade three system. So this is all sort of looking very positive at the time. The Victoria Harbour, which had been raised some issues in the, the development that had gone on around the Victoria Harbour, um, under the colonial regime and under the HKSAR as well. There were there were some good things that came about at the time. The protection of the harbour ordinance uh, was extended not just to protect the centre of the harbour, to the whole of Victoria Harbour as well, but of course there were some developments that went on and some reclam reclamations that were going on that many people considered to be quite bad for Victoria Harbour as well. In 2001, the Urban Renewal Authority uh, was set up under the ordinance with one of its purposes being to preserve buildings, sites and structures of historical, cultural or architectural interest. So this all seemed very positive in many ways. And in 2002, we get a, a, a very, uh, very well written report from Civic Exchange about saving Hong Kong's heritage, which identifies certain things that could be done to uh, enhance the protection of Hong Kong's heritage. It includes some revisions to the ordinance as well. There are also some issues which, again, seem to show that uh, uh, the, the SAR government were, were keen to um, actually listen to the public when it came to concerns about heritage. So the issue of Kong Tong Hall, um, of course, this I think, very interesting building, that sort of mixture of uh, uh, European and uh, classical and, and Chinese design that goes on in the interior of that particular building, um, was due to be sold by the church that then owned it to a developer who was planning to draw, you know, build more of these huge blocks of flats, flats that actually uh, um, uh, surround it. But when the story came out, there was a public outcry and the government responded. It negotiated with the church. It purchased the building for some 53 million Hong Kong dollars, which of course today sounds like a bargain. Uh, but of course, at the time was a considerable sum of public money. And again, they were faced with the, the problem that is one of the issues that we also have with these heritage buildings. Once you've got them, what do you do with them? You know, old buildings, very beautiful, wonderful, but, but actually, how do you use them? So they found a use for it. It became a museum to Dr. Sun Yat-sen. I don't think they've ever identified that the, well, the building was, put, was built, uh, I think, after uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sun would have been around. So I don't think there's many links they can actually put together there, but it's become a point on the, uh, the Sun Yat-sen trail as well. And again, it's, a, it's an interesting museum in Hong Kong and a nice uh, uh, preservation of one of our old buildings. It was finally, by the way, declared a monument in 2010 as well. There was also the issue of the Morrison building, this was the second use of a proposed monument, again, a, a privately owned building. Um, the government hearing that there was a, a proposal to actually um, develop the building, um, stepped in and made it a proposed monument. And um, 
It was then carried on and was actually declared as a monument in the face of opposition from the private owner of the building as well. So it showed, I think, a lot of positive things we'd take from that to do with the uh, at the post-colonial government's attitude towards built heritage. But then things go terribly wrong. And that's 2006 and 2007. In 2006 and 2007, you have to say that the government completely miscalculated uh, in understanding um, what buildings can mean to uh, the people of Hong Kong. So um, we get these issues. We get on the 11th of November 2006, the Star Ferry, the old uh, um, Edinburgh Place Ferry Pier, is to be pulled down. And the last ferry ride was on the 11th of November. People got very upset about this. They campaigned about this. It was part of that uh, reclamation of the harbour that was ongoing. It needed to be moved. But the idea that it would be completely removed, it'd be demolished, a lot of people got very upset, particularly to do with the clock tower. And following it, the following year, we get the Queen's Pier uh, and the um, removal of the Queen's Pier, the demolition of the Queen's Pier. Again, people get very upset with that. We also get some um, problems with some attempts to do uh, uh, renovation as well. So Li Tung Shi the Street, the wedding card street uh, in Wang Chai was renovated by the Urban Renewal Authority and attracted a lot of criticism. And again, uh, an issue arose with that building, King Yin Lee, uh, where the government initially failed to protect it, and that led to a public outcry. So if we think about each one of those, the first one, the Star Ferry Pier then, um, it had been known for some years that the, the reclamation would mean that the, the, the pier would go. But when, when the time got nearer, people got very emotional about this. They got very upset about it. Lots of people protested. People occupied the pier at one point as well, but the pier was demolished. Uh, we get recognition, perhaps, of the feelings of the people, in the then chief executive's uh, letter to Hong Kong in January of 2007, your insistence in preserving these buildings signifies the recognition of personal identity and the sense of belonging to Hong Kong. He said he was touched by the sincerity of the emotions expressed by people who are not represented by any well established group or political party. However, although he promised to keep pace with public sentiment on heritage issues, he also noted we cannot afford heritage preservation if we do not preserve our economic sustainability. So I think that's a bit like saying, we hear you, but we're not going to do anything about this in many ways. So um, we get an acknowledgement of people's feelings. Again, I think it was quite a miscalculation because, of course, then when we get the Queen's Pier, the follow on to the Star Ferry Pier being demolished, people get very upset. Uh, the Queen's Pier, again, here's a, a photograph of the of the last uh, Queen's Pier, which had been built in 1954. You have to say it wasn't that attractive uh, a structure. Um, that brutalist concrete architecture, which I suppose some people like, but uh, it was the significance of it. And of course, it's its colonial significance, which possibly, again, many people thought that was why the, the government, of course, wanted to get rid of it as well. So first of all, it's named after Queen Victoria. And of course, that's always been one of the issues with Victoria Harbour as well. Um, it was a public pier, but it also been used as a major ceremonial arrival and departure point, as it says there. It had been the official arrival point of all Hong Kong's governments since 1925, although, as I said, it's been replaced a number of times. The late Queen Elizabeth II visited in 1975. She landed here. Uh, the then Prince and Princess of Wales uh, in 1989, uh, King Charles III, uh, landed there in 1989 as well. So it had that sort of significance. And the government, I think, as I said, severely miscalculated. So we had quite violent scenes, quite violent protests as well. And again, many people don't seem to feel that, uh, don't realize how much people will, will react uh, when they see their heritage, these significant sites being removed from them. The actual uh, um, legal arguments to do with the pier, um, in the 9th of May, the Antiquities Advisory Board met and by a simple majority, uh, graded the pier grade one. But uh, the then Antiquities Authority, of course, decided I'm still going to remove the pier. Um, there was an application for judicial review in the August. And uh, within a couple of days, of course, the, the court first instance ruled that the Antiquities Authority's decision was legal. There'd been an argument that what he, he, hadn't, uh, he, he hadn't acknowledged uh, the Antiquities Advisory Board's grading of it as grade one. He should follow them. But of course, the statute doesn't say that. So it was legal. He had discretion not to declare the pier a monument. And the CFI agreed that the government should adopt a high threshold in declaring a monument 
in line with past practice. And of course, they were looking back to the colonial period as well in that past practice as well. So a few days after work began on dismantling the pier and it had been completely demolished by February of 2008. The Wedding Club Street, Lee Tung Street, of course, uh, when the Urban uh, Renewal Authority um, were tasked with renewing this, uh, this is what they came up with, Wedding Card Street, uh, which of course um, perhaps doesn't capture the old idea of the, the Tong Lao and everything else there. It, the, the term I'm going to use later on for another site in Hong Kong that's been used a number of times is a sort of Disneyfication. It's a sort of Disney version of heritage. And again, a lot of people criticise this. They criticise the loss of local community as well. But if I do want to speak up a little bit for the Urban Renewal Authority, we should remember that it's only one of their purposes is to consider the historical and heritage value of these sites. Their main purpose, of course, is to get rid of old buildings and in, in, in sanitary conditions that people live in and other things as well. So I think better balance that up a little bit there. And the other issue that occurred in uh, 2007, of course, was Kenyon Lee. And again, many people uh, will have passed this building. It's not easily accessible. It's uh, a building that only opens up to the public on a, a few days a year. I was lucky enough to visit a few years ago. It's a great building to go and see. It is an incredible structure, again, melding that sort of Chinese style with European styles as well. Um, great views over Hong Kong, wonderful place. Um, anyway, the issue is this. Um, the owner had, had, had purchased it quite recently before this and had started to develop it. He'd sent workmen up and they were starting to demolish the tiles and using matic drills on the top. They did this very visibly. Um, I think they did it in a deliberate way because um, this attracted a lot of public attention, again, public outcry. And now we've already had the issues to do with the Star Ferry and, uh, and uh, sorry, the Queen's Pier as well. And because of this, uh, the government did react. Um, the developer did say he'd approached the government before and said, would you like to buy this building from me or give me a land swap for it? And the government hadn't been interested. When there was a public outcry, the government did approach the uh, uh, the developer and did negotiate with him and did give him a land swap for this as well. And uh, a year after, um, the site was declared as a monument. Again, it highlights some of the problems with some of these buildings, though. As I said, it's it's not a convenient building to get to. As far as I know, it's still not being used for any purpose. The government has been looking for partners to use this building. At one point, it was suggested that it could be used as a um, uh, I think it was either a, a wedding venue, which I think people would quite see. Uh, but again, I'm not sure how much business you could do there. And the other one was as some sort of funeral uh, uh, associated business. But I don't think the local people who are quite, it's quite an expensive area to live, I believe, in that area. So perhaps local outcries about the idea of this being some sort of funeral associated place uh, led to that plan not being developed. There were some concessions because of all these things that had gone on. Um, these included the chief executive's policy address in October of that year, where it was highlighted that all new capital projects in Hong Kong would have a heritage impact assessment. And that, of course, is a, is a huge commitment, even though I would argue that heritage impact assessments haven't been that successful in Hong Kong. And that's not because of the archaeologists and others who are involved in them. It's just that to be successful, you need a will within those receiving the assessment to actually follow the advice that you're given. Um, there was the creation of a commission of uh, heritage office to support the Secretary for Development and focus on heritage. And there was this new plan, the revitalizing historic buildings through partnership scheme for government owned historic buildings. Again, this is the idea that the government would, um, would renovate these heritage buildings and then work in partnership with um, uh, usually not-for-profit organizations to use the building in some way to make it at least to pay the costs of the building, to make it commercially viable for the use of these buildings as well. There were other concessions as well. With Queen's Pier itself, remember, the idea was it would be demolished, um, but there was no plan originally for it to be rebuilt. Now, we were promised at the time, or shortly afterwards, that because of public concern, the Queen's Pier will be rebuilt. And of course, that's still, well, it's, we're still waiting for that to happen, but there are still discussions ongoing, although some people are unhappy that it seems that it's gonna be built far away from its, uh, its previous position uh, in the, um, in the centre of the harbour as well. As I said, King Yin Lee as well, that could be seen as a concession. When people got very upset about the damage that was being do done to the roof of King Yin Lee, 
the government did negotiate with the developer and did offer a land swap. And land swaps, you know, they, that's still public money that's being used. So the government did get involved. I think that was a concession because they'd seen how wrong they'd got it about the, uh, the Queen's Pier. Uh, also linked into this at the time, although it, it linked into uh, uh, the PRC policy at the time as well, was we get the introduction of our intangible cultural heritage policy. And Hong Kong, as with many other areas of China, has, um, has expanded a lot of money on promoting our intangible cultural heritage. So this is, of course, the promotion of our local recipes, of our local dances, of our uh, uh, local traditions and customs as well. So again, there was a big emphasis on the time of this, and, and that's continued, which I think, again, is, well, we can say it's because, of course, China uh, has celebrated its intangible cultural heritage generally, and all parts of China have been doing this, but I think it was also part of the government saying, we need to we need to perhaps appease people because they've been so upset. And then we see also, I think, a change in the gazetting of monuments, because in the in the 30 year period from 1976 to 2007, there were 63 monuments gazetted um, and the, the. The Hong Kong SAR hadn't sort of got any done any more, any less really than the, the colonial government. But then by in the, in the next 15 years, we're now up to 132. So I think we've definitely seen an increase in the identification and the designation of monuments in Hong Kong. But we have seen some failures and some successes. So I'll start with the failures because it's nice to end with the successes. Um, in 2011, I think Hotung Gardens is something that we all, uh, those of us who are here, those of us who are old enough, remember um, the issue that arose there. Hotung Gardens, of course, associated with, with Sir Robert Hotung, a very important character in Hong Kong's history. Uh, again, in being one of the first sort of Chinese members of the um, of the, I mean, the executive council at that point as well. And of course, uh, um, one of the first people permitted by the British to actually build a house on the peak. This is Hotung Gardens. Uh, we get the announcement that the that is, I think it's his granddaughter, uh, was going to demolish the building and would build new houses on the site. And of course, it's an extremely valuable site. Um, the Again, there was a public outcry, the idea that this building should be protected. Uh, the government, again, uh, made this a proposed monument, which which again is, is a significant step. You are interfering with private property rights. So it's a significant thing for any jurisdiction to do, but I think in particular for Hong Kong with the value of private property rights in Hong Kong. They tried to negotiate with the owner. She asked, I think, for at the time about seven billion Hong Kong dollars for the site. Uh, in the end, the government decided not to actually purchase the site. And there was there was some criticism, but I think there was also a recognition. The, the head of the Antiquities Advisory Board at the time said, you know, we've got to, we've got to be mindful. This is public money. Seven billion Hong Kong dollars can be used for a lot of other good things in Hong Kong. And again, if we do buy this building, what are we going to do with it? Where's the value going to be to us all? Apart from it's just its heritage value. So um, the, the building was demolished. And uh, of course, it was then sold off. It was sold off for a significantly lower sum, by the way. And of course, that was another thing that was identified by uh, the Antiquities Advisory Board. They said this could be used as guidance in the future for negotiation to do with purchasing sites as well. Um, it was a reminder to us all. Uh, other issues, we, we had the old walled village in front of the Yemen, the last walled village in uh, urban uh, Kowloon, um, of course, which um, was uh, subject to development, again, by the Urban Renewal Authority as well. There were some photos taken in 2016, just before the last parts were being demolished. Because, again, of a, of a public outcry, um, there were there has been some commitment to some incorporation of some heritage elements in the new development. Uh, but again, some people said, look, it's the last wall village. Shortly before the final demolition was going on, some archaeolog archaeologists were allowed access and did find archaeological re remains of the original walls and the, the gate towers and other things. So the idea was some people were saying we should really be be put placing more value on this. The Urban Renewal Authority has said it will incorporate some of these elements into its developments. Uh, but uh, again, we see the losses. Um, the Marine Police Headquarters, I said to you that back in, in the uh, 1970s, 1976-77, of course, there was the idea that the uh, colonial administration was going to demolish the Marine Police Headquarters. If we think about where this site is, it, of course, is an extremely valuable piece of land. We've got some of the, the most expensive shopping 
uh, uh, land in, in the world there. Um, so when the announcement was made that the site would be saved and that it would in the end uh, um, be renovated, uh, subject to strict protection of certain things, shui trees and other elements as well. Everyone was very happy. When the development was carried out, a lot of local people, uh, a lot of local architects and experts in heritage as well, were very upset about this because they said, actually, it's not really representative of the original Marine Police headquarters. Again, uh, the term that's been used is Disney heritage for this. Um, I, I know whenever I go past, it tends to be just a sort of a photo taking opportunity um again i think that the flip side is we have to think about this as being a valuable site and again what do we do with this site if we don't turn it into a hotel and a or a, a restaurant and a shopping sort of area um i think that's always going to be the the question of what to do with this but yes a lot of people were upset with it they're also concerned about other um what sometimes people would consider to be insignificant elements of our built heritage. So one of these was, of course, our post boxes in Hong Kong. And again, it's, it's appropriate, I suppose, to, to remember uh, the late Queen here, because one of the issues was that a number of our post boxes in Hong Kong, some 59, uh, as it says there, um, have the royal ciphers of, well, uh, I think it's of uh, Queen Elizabeth II and of her father um, on them. And of course, um, there was this announcement from Hong Kong Post uh, that the display of the royal ciphers on the post boxes is inappropriate. Uh, again, it seems to have been a big miscalculation because many people got very upset about this. The idea that these would just be obliterated, that whether they'd be an angle grinder would be used to remove them or they'd be covered over. A lot of people said, well, they're still part of our heritage. Even if it's an uncomfortable time, it's still part of our built heritage. And again, uh, the Hong Kong Post had to sort of retract this statement and say, we're, we're not doing anything, we're just going to leave them. And uh, as far as I know, they're still there. This is one that's just opposite to the temple in Sai Kung. So I pass that one quite regularly. And I always check to see if the, the cipher is still there. But it was an issue that links into a lot of things that come up with our built heritage. More recently, um, it, it's difficult to see whether this would come within the uh, categorization of built heritage. But we've seen a lot of people concerned about things like the jumbo restaurant or this, uh, the jumbo restaurant. Um, we also see these issues going on at the moment where we know that lots of businesses are going under, uh, linked into famous Dai Pai Dongs and other uh, sort of uh, um, bakeries and important elements of our heritage in Hong Kong. That comes more into what is usually termed the intangible cultural heritage. But again, I think the fact that people are concerned about this, that they do raise these issues, shows again how important cultural heritage is generally to Hong Kong. I think we should focus on some of the positives. Um, so we should think of things like these, the Blue House in, in Wen Chai, um, uh, which, uh, again, the, these sort of Tong Lao, the, the, the shop houses uh, that were quite standard in Hong Kong that are becoming rarer. And again, this is in our newspapers in the last week or so that people are getting more concerned that these, these buildings are being developed. Here we get a, a development of one of these sites, a, a, a conservation, which wins one of UNESCO's conservation awards. So I think we should say that this is a success in, in preservation. Um, the, the Red House that I mentioned before, a uh, house uh, linked into um, uh, the um, revolutionary uh, links of Hong Kong in the past. Um, again, the negotiation with the owner by the government, the designation of it as a proposed monument, the commitment to providing some funding for its preservation for another 10 years, I think that should be seen as a success as well. And then we get things like the old Taiyo police station, Again, we get these, these partnerships now going on where the government will pay for the, the conservation, the preservation of the buildings, and then enter into a partnership with some form of not-for-profit organization usually to uh, commercially use the building so that it takes some of the burden off, well, off the state, off the taxpayer as well. Um, here we see the old police station in Taipo as well. And again, uh, that will be put down as one of the successes. I think, again, uh, the old police station has won some awards because it's been seen as a success in this form of partnership. Um, one of my favourites, but not everyone's favourites, is Taikun. Um, and, you know, the, the, the central police station, uh, the magistrate's courts, the, the prison, um, this sort of long disused group of buildings uh, on Hollywood Road, really in the, in the middle of, of sort of old Hong Kong, uh, the renovation of this, the, the partnership that went on with the Jockey Club, 
Um, well, I think it's a great success. And I've got friends who don't like this. I've got friends who are perhaps are purists in the heritage world and don't like the way this is being used. But again, I think the, the argument has to be that we've got conservation of the buildings. Um, there was uh, a, a collapse of one of the buildings as the renovation was going on. But again, speaking to people who were involved, they said that you know the structure was at one point so rotten uh, that you know accidents do happen. And of course, that has been rebuilt in a very similar sympathetic style as well. But now the site offers a number of things in a very, a very convenient area in Hong Kong. Um, the museums, the galleries, uh, the court as a museum itself, uh, the ability for people to walk through the prison block. I think it's always interesting to walk through a prison block with people who haven't been to prison. And as lawyers, many of us have been to prison in that way, not, not inside, but some of us uh, have been to visit people in prison. It gives you a good idea of what of what life in a prison, and particularly in, in these old prisons, um, the conditions there were. So these are good things. And of course, then we've got all of the, the recreational areas, the fact that the arts are allowed to be performed there when we can have live performances, uh, the restaurants, the bars and everything else. It provides a very, I think, uh, important uh, focal point in Hong Kong. And I think it's been done very well. But as I said, I have got friends who are not so uh, enamored of this, but I put that down as one of the successes. Another success I would put down is this, is the Central Market, um, a, a Bauhaus style building, which I think has been, again, very sympathetically uh, uh, conserved. Uh, and again, seems to have a good use. You know, as, as things have opened up, hopefully as we're moving away from COVID, hopefully more and more people will use the restaurants in here and everything else and keep this as a sort of viable commercial proposition as well, where we get a very a very important building in Hong Kong's history, which is actually very useful for everyone to use, uh, somewhere very beautiful and somewhere that people can go and enjoy as well, which has got to be the best of everything to do with our built heritage. One success, I think, which has come out of uh, what could have been conceived to be a failure is this. This is the old Sacred Hill uh, um, MTR station. And uh, many of you will know the issues that arose when the, the development was going on for these extensions to the rail, like the MTR lines uh, uh, back in the mid, uh, in the 2015 or so. Um, it was suddenly announced uh, that some archaeological remains had been discovered. In fact, what had been discovered was a well, famously. And of course, there were big question marks coming up at the time. This links into, um, again, the concession in 2007 of the um, designation that all capital uh, uh, projects in Hong Kong have to have um, a heritage impact assessment. Many people said, well, how can you just suddenly discover a well? You should have really known it was there. There would have been a heritage impact assessment undertaken. And of course there was. And this is one of the issues we have with our heritage impact assessment scheme. Um, the heritage impact assessment schemes are carried out, are the, the surveys are carried out by archeologists. So I think do very good jobs. They, they do them at various levels and I won't go into all the detail of the way that they do this, but they usually identify that there is the likelihood of there being some sort of heritage there. They, they can't always be right, but if they do, they will then make recommendations. And the first recommendation should be the preservation of whatever is found in situ. Now, apparently at this point, um, uh, it was suggested that perhaps the station should be built, should be moved so that the if, uh, heritage wouldn't be impacted. Um, those in, in charge of this particular decision decided to disregard that uh, advice and then when the well was discovered well talking to some of those involved in the construction at the time um when i said to them it must be terrible to you know get all these delays and everything else they said no this is very useful uh, if you're in a big capital project uh, an excuse for a delay and an overspend is a very useful thing so uh, perhaps that worked so well but our heritage impact assessments um although they're often regarded as the gold standard in other places in asia I think there are problems with their actual their recognition and their implementation as well. Uh, but I do think well, what's happened since, you know, turning this into a sort of a temporary museum, showing the remains and everything else, this seems to be uh, quite a sensible way of engaging people again in the history and the heritage of Hong Kong. And there are going to be future developments to do with the well as well. There are also some private projects as well. Um, there was great concern about the state theatre in in, uh, in North Point. Uh, this is a building I think many of us had passed many years, and it's such an interesting building in many ways. That great frieze on the front and that very, very impressive roof uh, with those incredible trusses 
uh, and everything else made it quite distinctive. Many of us uh, may have ventured inside at times and seen the little sort of shop units and everything else. Uh, but there was concern about the future of this and a, a group got together and started to campaign for some protection of the building in some way. One of the big issues, of course, was that it was subject to uh, many different owners uh, and different forms of, of lease and, and uh, ownership within the particular building as well. Uh, well, it's now been purchased by a private company. They managed to deal with all of those legal issues. I think their lawyers must have worked overtime to try and negotiate with everyone involved and in actually settling all of those problems. And of course, the, uh, the, the company concerned have announced um, that they will conserve the building within their new development. And um, we were very lucky at COHK Law. Um, I think it was only last year that we were invited along on one of these tours and we got to tour around inside, which was it was wonderful to see the old little units and, and hear a little bit about the whole story of the theatre and actually then to get up onto the roof uh, where I think in many other jurisdictions, perhaps they wouldn't have let you up onto a roof. But uh, in Hong Kong, we were great. We, we could go up onto the roof. And uh, I think the Dean, uh, we all posed on those trusses up at the top there. I should have put up one of those photographs, shouldn't I? Of the Dean posing on the roof, but uh, maybe another time. So I think we've been promised that this building will be preserved, conserved in some way, along with the development. And I think that's got to be something very positive. Why, why is this company doing this? I think possibly because those involved actually value heritage themselves. But I also think an important thing is that they realise that the people of Hong Kong uh, value their heritage. And this is a this is a positive thing in public relations. If you are a company involved in, in, in dealing with the public, well, if you can if you can do something which actually encourages people to come along to your development projects and other things and, and shows that you are concerned about Hong Kong, that's got to be a positive thing as well. One of the last things to mention, of course, is I showed you that photograph of where my local uh, uh, ancestral hall had been demolished and uh, I was worried that there would be just uh, uh, village houses being uh, built in place of it. This is what now replaces it. There is still a little ancestral hall. I don't think it's a bad sort of design for it. Um, and we have two sort of mini uh, small houses uh, on the sides of them as well. Um, first, I wasn't too sure about this. I think it just tells us the story about what often happens in, in many places where we get change. And perhaps the fact that we still have the ancestral hall incorporated in it and the customs, the intangible cultural heritage of Hong Kong are still continued there is a positive thing. Um, another story just to, to finish off, um, I showed you the photographs earlier of uh, the, the idea that sometimes heritage gets forgotten. Uh, this is the photographs that surfaced at the time of the um, water department starting to demolish the old reservoir at Bishop's Hill, uh, or the place that's now referred to as Bishop's Hill. And this attracted, again, a great outcry. When these photographs went out on social media, they went viral and people got very upset about this. Uh, the government, of course, said, well, hold on, it's the water department. They, they need to talk about this. And the water department very quickly realised this was not a very good public relations issue. And they said, hold on, we, we'll stop. You know, we, we didn't realise what was happening. We didn't realise perhaps the value of this site and we will do something about this. And again, um, many of us, I think, have now been on tours of this particular uh, reservoir. It looks quite majestic. Um, it's It's been compared to some sort of water cathedral at times as well. It is a great space. Um, and the Water Department have committed to preserving it and using it in some way in the future. Um, it was interesting, by the way, going along there and hearing that although we think this is very sort of decorative and almost Byzantine in those arches and the and the stones and everything else, um, this was just a utilitarian form of building. This was probably the cheapest way to fall, to build this reservoir at the time. And it just happens to be perhaps today aesthetically pleasing to many of us. So it, it, just one of those lucky chances as well. The Water Department did, by the way, then come out afterwards and say there'd been something similar that they demolished a few years before. And again, they then committed to a full review of um, reservoirs and, and other uh, associated structures in Hong Kong to make sure that that similar things didn't happen as well. And the Antiquities Advisory Board, I believe, have been involved in that as well. The only issue now, of course, is again, what do you do with this space? Uh, so uh, I think the water, the, the water Department have been asking for suggestions, public suggestions of what to do with this space. Because if you do go to visit, it is at the top of quite a high hill. Uh, so if you're going in the summer, it's quite hot to get up there as well. 
uh, but uh, but thinking of a useful use of it, well, that'll be for the future of Hong Kong's heritage. So that's a sort of quick run through, um, I think, to do with the, the development of the protection of, uh, of uh, Hong Kong's built heritage. Today, my conclusion is to do what protection there is. The ordinance itself, as I said, it offers two forms of protection. The first is automatic if we get one of these antiquities, these sites, uh, which is pre-1800. Uh, and, uh, and of course, a lot of the things that we're now thinking of buildings that we might want to be protected are not going to fall in that category. And otherwise, really, the only protection comes as designation as a proposed monument or a monument by the Antiquities Authority. And that will be subject usually to recommendations from the Antiquities Advisory Board, subject to their grading schemes as well. But what is important, I think, in the protection of built heritage in Hong Kong today is the public voice, uh, because I think this is one of the few areas where when the public get upset about this in recent years, at least possibly since 2007, the government have responded, the government have listened. And um, that's important. I think, again, I think the, the government realised perhaps mistakes that it made and the colonial government made as well in not realising the value of these buildings to the people of Hong Kong. Now they've realized, and I think perhaps that means that we will get more effective protection uh, um, from the government, perhaps spurred on by public voices as well. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, of course, all of us now want to leave our offices and go and visit all those uh, interesting sites that you have mentioned, uh, which is probably not um that easy because we need to continue to work but um thank you it was uh, fascinating and um of course eye-opening in parts um again if you have questions please chat in we have some received some questions but if you have questions please use the chat function to um uh, send them over and i will read them out um, on your behalf and um, can i ask with the first question uh, that we have received how does hong kong's uh, heritage protection compare with uh, protection of built heritage in the mainland Singapore and Macau? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it, it's interesting. Um, the mainland, I think, it, it depends where you are in the mainland, but there is some. there are some great conservation projects in the mainland. Of course, uh, one of my favourites is when you go to Guangzhou and you see some of those old, again, not just the ancient Chinese buildings, but the colonial buildings as well. I think the mainland's done very well in sort of uh, in, in preserving and conserving those, perhaps in highlighting their history in a way that fits a particular narrative. But again, still the buildings are being conserved and preserved and enjoyed as well. So many places, I think, in the mainland, um, there's quite an effective uh, protection of um, these old buildings. There are, of course, some some notable exceptions as well. If we think about nearer to home in Macau, um, uh, the um, uh, Macau, of course, has got the, the benefit of a UNESCO designation uh, for the centre of the, the historic centre of Macau as well. Um, so I think they have, you know, there's, there's great protection there. And of course, um, they've done some useful things, probably banishing most of the casinos to sort of a, a particular area, new developments in that way probably has done a lot to protecting some of their heritage as well. Uh, but I mean, that raises an interesting issue for Hong Kong. You know, should we be seeking to get a UNESCO World Heritage uh, designation for uh, an area in Hong Kong? And of course, that did arise back in 2011. I think we, we had a, there was an issue at the time about perhaps we should put something forward to uh, to China to actually put up to the uh, World Heritage List. And of course, China now, I think, is, is second in the number of heritage sites in the world, um, only to, I think, Italy is the first and, and China is the second. I think it's along those lines. But um, the idea was we should identify something. Um, at the time, um, the it, it seems that the administration had identified the, the, the Chilean nunnery at Diamond Hill, the photograph I showed earlier, which, of course, it got some derision from people in Hong Kong. They said, well, hold on, it's not even that old. Now, actually, to be on the World Heritage List, you don't always have to have something that's that's particularly old. Um, and there are notable exceptions to that. But there were some concerns. Possibly the, the area that should be designated as a World Heritage Site in Hong Kong would be the Victoria Harbour, um, because I think that's just, that's something that's iconic. You know, everyone in the world recognises the sort of the harbour skyline and everything else. The issue, I think, there and possibly why it wasn't raised at the time was 
the idea that if you have something designated as a World Heritage Site, you can no longer develop, you can no longer do anything to that site, which isn't quite true. Again, if you think of, uh, if I think of my place of birth in London, I think of um, uh, the, say, the Tower of London and, and, you know, heritage sites like that. Well, the Tower of London has been photobombed uh, by various horrible buildings in the background over the last few years. So there doesn't seem to be much problem there. It doesn't seem that the, uh, that, that the tower will be losing its, uh, its World Heritage designation. So perhaps that would be something for the future for Hong Kong to think about uh, some form of UNESCO designation, perhaps for the harbour. Other people have considered uh, um, other areas in Hong Kong, but for me, the harbour stands out. With, um, with Singapore, you know, again, Singapore's got some notable successes and they, they may be bringing in a new law to do with protecting their heritage as well. Um, but, uh, but as I said before, I mentioned that our heritage impact assessments, I think there are problems with the implementation of the scheme, the following through on the scheme as well. One of the things that Singapore had been considering at one point was implementing a similar scheme to us. So they were looking to us as having the best protection scheme, in, at least in the uh, when we're developing and sort of protecting against sites that we might discover. Um, uh, I was very unpopular at a conference in Singapore a few years ago where I said, well, I'm not sure it works that well. And I noted the, uh, uh, the Sacred Hill site and uh, other issues that have arisen with our heritage impact schemes. But yeah, we need to, we need to modernize our law in Hong Kong. That's really the point. If we think about our ordinance, it was originally first drafts in the early 1960s. Um, again, I would say that there wasn't much will to actually implement the very restricted law in the 1970s by the colonial administration. And um, really, it was mainly focused originally on archaeology rather than on what today we term built heritage. So we probably need a revision of our law in Hong Kong perhaps incorporating the Antiquities Advisory Board's grading system and making it some form of legislative protection as well, or at least giving mild forms of protection to these buildings that are identified in that, in that way. Thank you. Following up on that, um, one of the key issues, of course, is what, what is a heritage building? You know, how old does it have to be? You showed the, the, the photo of that beautiful post office, uh, which was then demolished and replaced with something which I got it as pretty ugly, but then there was some discussion some time ago to knock this one down. Actually, it's ongoing. It's probably just be decided already. Um, and now everybody, you know, is upset because now this is regarded as heritage, as ugly heritage, probably. So, where where is the what's the balance? Where where you know what 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 uh, what is a heritage building? You showed the photo of the HSBC building. Which I think is already history in, in, in a way because it's 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 very important and it was built in a particular time and it means something. So what what is the ideal definition here? What what uh, should we look at? Uh, well, the Antiquity Advisory Board has on it, on its website. I'll give you the the sort of the factors that they look for, and they they've attracted a lot of criticism at the time in the yeah. past for not considering. Uh, certain buildings, perhaps sort of the more modern, the 1950s or not, you know, post-war buildings or whatever else. <coughs> um, but, but actually, I think they've really, I think they've really sort of changed their attitude in recent years. Uh, again, I think they've been listening to the public and bringing in other people to join who've got different views. So we have seen, a, I think, a change of interest. You know, the, the recent designation designation of the the city hall as a monument. You start thinking, wow, you know, a lot of people go. That's a very modern building. A lot of people might say it's quite an ugly building. It's a, again, you know, perhaps not the most attractive building we think of. It's not got all the sort of the Gothic arches. Some people would term Gothic monstrosities to do with the old mm. post office or that sort of Byzantine sort of frontage of the different stones and everything else. But of course, they started to look at other factors. It's not just the architectural styles. It is the historical importance. It is the fact that, you know, many things, City Hall has seen many things to do with Hong Kong's history, and that's why it's important there. Um, and, and also including the idea that we should consider different architectural styles and perhaps more modern architectural styles. So I don't think there's a very restrictive interpretation. And I think the, the Antiquities Advisory Board have been trying to sort of widen things and consider more, uh, more different types of building to bring them in. You mentioned... Uh, um, the HSBC building, Norman Foster's building. 
uh, again, uh, you know, there are many people in Metnong who don't like that building. Uh, to me, I think it's very sort of iconic again of Hong Kong. You know, it's one of the first things I remember coming to Hong Kong, seeing the HSBC seal building, um, you know, the interesting open space below, the escalators, everything else. Um, and that's one thing I, I, I pose that to our students sometimes. I say, OK, it's the fourth building to be on that site. Uh, you know, even though HSBC may have some issues going on at the moment, maybe one day they decide that they want to a new building. So do they just destroy that building? Do they just demolish that? And, and what do they build in its place? Um, you know, we know that some of the buildings next to it, the old Bank of China building has had that really wonderful sort of conservation ongoing and, and it looks really great now, that building. Um, the old Supreme Court around it as well. In some ways, I think Norman Foster's building works really well there. So I would I would be sad if that went. Um, some people wouldn't, but I you know, I don't know if anyone's thought about talking to HSBC about designating that as a monument yet. Anyway. But yeah, I, I think it's a bit more fluid uh, and perhaps we don't want too rigid a definition of what is built heritage. Yeah, well, with, with the HSBC building, it's easy to uh, remove it, right? Because you can just pack up. Uh, that's Section, what that it? <laughs> I believe so, isn't it? It's yes. built to be packed into boxes and to be shipped to, I don't know, another place. Maybe, maybe that, maybe Norman Foster wouldn't be too upset with the uh, with the building being removed. But I think many, uh, quite a few people, I think, would miss it. It is quite an iconic building again in our skyline. I agree. Uh, we are running out of time, but one more question uh, here, uh, and apologies to uh, all those uh, who are sending questions uh, which we cannot ask. Um, is there major built heritage which is neither Chinese nor English in Hong Kong? Uh, well, I suppose we could talk about the European uh, and, and other buildings. So, um, I mean, if you mean in style or even in the people that built it, I think it's difficult to say the, the people who would have built this would have been Hong Kongers, wouldn't they? They would have been people who were here. So I, I think that's, but I know, I mean, if it's not Chinese in style or it's not, say, English colonial in style, we have, of course, got the, uh, again, I've got the name of the, the mosque, which is on the escalators, the Jemaya Mosque, I think it is, which has, again, recently been declared a monument. I hadn't visited that until last year, and I went there, and again, I thought it was a really interesting even the complex of buildings is really interesting as well, but it's in quite a distinctive style, which which sort of stands out, I think, from from Chinese and from perhaps European architecture as well. So yeah, there there are other buildings that we've got different styles because we've had so many different people coming through Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is made up of so many different people. Yeah, and uh, of course, many buildings have elements of yeah. um, different cultures. You mentioned King Yun Lee. Um, I just watched the 1955 Soldier of Fortune movie, which is great, and they have that building there. And then, you know, you walk inside, and uh, you've been inside. I've been inside. You've been inside, and then you see it in the movie. It's it's great. I mean, that that is a great. I would always recommend people if you get the chance. When I think they still have open days, it's yes. in, in the, whatever when they open it. It's a great building to wander around. It does show you that sort of. I think the opulence of the time, wasn't it? The wealth of the time as well. Yeah. Um, and it, outside with the swimming pool, right? The swimming pool is great, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful. It again shows a different way of living, perhaps, at that time. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you very, very much for this uh, fantastic talk. And thanks to everybody uh, for joining today. Uh, what remains for me is to announce upcoming events uh, that uh, we are. Uh, here at CHK Law will be having. First one is the next in our Greater China Legal History Seminar Series. Um, Mr. Douglas Clark, um, one of our uh, star speakers uh, of the past, will talk about Sterling Fessenden, the American boss of Shanghai 1925 to 1939, and that uh, will be on the 14th of October, same time, 12.30 to 2 p.m. Then we have upcoming on the 23rd of September um, at 12.45 as part of our Greater Bay Area Forum seminars. Um, sem two seminars actually in one delivered by colleagues, Professor Jian Li and Professor Elisa Mick, speaking on the legal implications of AI in the context of copyright and transaction automation in the Greater Bay Area. And um, on the 30th of September, Professor Xi Chao will talk about cryptocurrency regulation in China. 
and this is part of the Center of Legal Innovation and Digital Societies uh, seminar series. So we hope to see you all um, at the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series, but also the other seminars that are organized by CUHK Law. Um, many thanks again to you, Steve, um, and thanks to everybody for joining today. Uh, have a nice afternoon, and hopefully we will meet soon again at one of the CHK Law um, seminars. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.